Uh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, your lordship, uh, welcome to FIBA's 131st meeting. Welcome to our journey that started 20 years ago. And I'd also like to say a big welcome to a very special man, Dr. Firuz Nadeida. Can I ask you to be get on with the business of today, let me start by saying, what is Viva? Why are we here? Um, there are three main purposes to Viva. Number one, we are here to learn from each other. Now, most of you, all of you, have a stacks of qualification. We have people from Imperial College, which, uh, Ruth Bezari, thank you for coming with your group. Uh, we have people from my old university, the City University, uh, Iranian society. I'd like to thank Abba Musavi uh, and also Vaziri um, Pur uh, for being so active with uh, the uh, City University Iranian society. And also, all of you have qualification. But what Biba mainly is about is about application. Because what I've learned in life, <coughs> education is only 10% of life. 90% of life is application. It's what you do with that education. And my friends, trust me. In no books you find anything about application. Application is actually by doing things, meeting successful people like Dr. Firuz Nadari, who has put ideas into action. Now, it's at events like this, at institutions like this, at associations like this, where you learn about application. And we are measured not by our education, we are measured by our application. So we are here to improve our application. Let's take again Dr. Firuz Nadari. What are we going to learn from him by application? NASA, by nature, recruits the best and brightest. So what does best and brightest mean? It means very clever people that at the same time are high achievers. And usually high achievers are very competitive. So NASA is full of these very clever people, high achievers and highly competitive. Unfortunately, what it comes with these characteristics is <coughs> mountain-sized egos because they all are competitive they want to push their ideas so then it takes special people like Dr. Firuz Nadari to get all these people together and to win their trust by saying if I'm not better I'm equal and allow me to lead you and you get these all these people with high energy to channel their way to complete a mission with a time limit with a, uh, also within the budget. So this is a great achievement. I mean, it's a very hard work to do, and this is what's called application. And this is what application is about. It's actually putting things within the time limit, within the budget, and achieving your goals at more than even 100%. So that's what we are here, that's number one. To learn from each other how to improve our application. Number two, we are here for networking. Now, networking is the technical term or buzzword for getting to know each other. Again, let's take Dr. Firuz Nadari. His Facebook is very popular. He's got some like over 35,000 people uh, on that. He's known internationally. But actually to meet the man personally, to see him in action, is totally different. Actually to talk to him. Because then you see things in people that you never see from distance. And also, there's an opportunity to put your ideas through, to have a discussion with people. Life begins with networking. This idea of tribalism, that we have to work in a small network, and we have you know, to just keep to on our own, is totally wrong. The reason why Western civilization is so great, because they reach out to everyone. They hate tribalism. If tribalism worked in NASA, Dr. Firuz Nadari wouldn't be one of, one of the top directors in NASA. So this is what Western civilization achieved, and that's what at Bebo we are trying to promote. We are against any form of tribalism. We are about expanding ourselves and reaching out to other people, working with them. Teamwork starts with networking. So te you know, teamwork is very, very important. Also, the third is exchange of ideas, free flow of information. Now, unless you have free flow of information, ideas do not exchange. 
And if the ideas do not exchange, they, you can't improve ourselves. We have, again, NASA. We want to learn what is happening in the world, why there are so many changes. They are at the frontier of technology. And if you go back to my previous point, just again consider NASA. What, what is NASA doing today here? They are networking here. Through who? Through Dr. Nadri. So if NASA is doing networking, it's for us all to do networking. If NASA is, is allowing its information to be available to everybody, we must be doing the same thing. So it brings me back all these to the business of today. That what is happening? Now, for the last six years, since 2008, we are being, having a very difficult time. I mean, it started with the financial collapse, and people blamed on banks and so on, so which they were right. But by 2010, banks had recovered, but our economy has not recovered. And everybody is asking, asking, why has not our economy recovered? Now, I've been going to America quite a lot in the last five years. And in 2010, every meeting I went, the common thing was that the old ways of doing things, the old models of doing business or doing things, does not work anymore. We have to find new ways, new models. But nobody knew what they actually meant. But they knew that the old ways is not working. It has to be new ways. And it's only in the last two years and it become apparent that there have been major changes, that the financial collapse was only the trigger, but there have been major changes, and that's what we are here to discuss today and to learn. Let me give you a few examples. Information, ladies and gentlemen, is now totally free. When I joined financial services in 1985, to have information on a client who was worth 1,000 pounds. In 2013, the same information is worth 30 pounds because it's available on public domain. So people like me, who have over 7,000 clients, had a major drop in my capital, because now the information is available. Same thing about banks. Banks' shares are not going up, because they had all these clients with the information. Now it is available. So Wonga, and then peer lending, and then crowd uh, sourcing. These, all these new financials that can come into operation without having a long established client banks. Because information is free. So this is one aspect of just information being free. Communication is free. To call Iran was one pound 30 years ago. Today it's three pence. So communication is free. The whole thing has changed. Broadcasting. Broadcasting has changed. I, I don't want to knock my friend's business here, Said Karimian, who's got Gem TV and he's got 14 channels. But he, he, didn't, he got into this business only about five or six years ago, he found a niche market and he's doing very well, and so on and so But before, to be a broadcaster, you had to have huge, huge amount of capital. Now, now, if you have a good idea, you have a niche market, right product, you could be there. And ladies and gentlemen, now the biggest television channel is YouTube. Who would have thought that YouTube started in 2006? Now it's the biggest television channel is YouTube. So it's major changes. Marketing. Marketing has changed. We, we supposed to be good at be in marketing. We knew how to have meetings and how to do mail shots. Now with Facebook and LinkedIn and so many other things coming on, we've got Sion McCaslin now on board to advise us about marketing on Biba, how to do things, because the social media has changed the entire marketing and it's free, but you just have to know what to do. And then you get journalism. Journalism has changed. It's free now with Twitter. And the next thing that's going to be free is energy. With uh, Latin America coming online, Africa coming online, North America becoming energy independent with fracking and so many other things. In 10 years time, energy will be free. We'll be selling barrel of oil at $30 in 10 years time. So all these kind of changes, and that's the reason why we are finding it difficult to do business. But that doesn't mean we cannot make business. And what, where does Fuse Nodary comes into it? Because all these changes, comes from US, it comes from Silicon Valley, it comes from MIT, <coughs> it comes from uh, um, MIT, Silicon Valley, help me out, Harvard. one other place. Harvard. Harvard, one more place. Stanford. NASA. <laughs> 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 That's what I'm trying to get. It comes from NASA, all these things. These are frontier technology. 
So ladies and gentlemen, I think I have given a bit of a start to the meeting today. So I'd like you to put your hands together and kindly welcome Dr. Firuz Nadeh. Uh, welcome. I would like to add my welcome to Bob Axe. I appreciate that you're spending a uh, part of your Sunday with me. Um, I also like to welcome my cousins from Cambridge and Birmingham. It's always good to have family in your talks because no matter how badly it goes, <laughs> at the end they <laughs> liked you. They say it was really good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm counting on you. Um, it is uh, easy to give a technical talk, and it's also easy to give a public lecture. It's unfortunately a bit more difficult to give a talk to a mixed audience, uh, because if you aim one way, you lose half of the audience and, uh, and vice versa. So we have some people here today from technical universities who could, in fact, give uh, part of my lecture today. But then, as I understand it, the majority of people do not have a technical background. They don't, they aren't engaged. Can you turn these mics on? Um, they come from uh, a different background. So I have erred on the side of a public lecture. So what I will be talking about today, hopefully, is accessible by you know, uh, every member of the audience. And for those of you uh, steeped in uh, uh, technical matters, I beg your indulgence. And if you want to ask me some questions afterwards, I'll be happy to oblige. OK, so um, I'm basically a storyteller. Uh, I like to take um, things that we do in NASA, which may be complicated, and then express them in a way that people who don't come from a technical background, they find it intriguing and fascinating. So uh, what I was hoping to do today for you is to tell you four stories. It is the, the program today. Uh, the first two stories are momentous uh, events that happened in space exploration, uh, both of them uh, coincidentally a year ago, August. So the first one, uh, the scientists announced with uh, a fair amount of excitement that the first man-made object, a spacecraft that NASA built in, uh, and launched 37 years ago, has left the solar system. So, you know, you may ask, well, I didn't know there was a boundary. Is there a sign that says, you know, nice of you to visit solar system, you're leaving, hope you, you, know, you come back and visit. Where is the property line? Where is the boundary of the solar system? Is there a boundary? What does it mean that the spacecraft crossed over to interstellar? So the, during the first 15 minutes, I'm going to take you on a tour of the solar system, how it came about, what are the components, and is there a boundary? Uh, and what, are, what is the definition of the solar system boundary? So that's the first story that I'll talk to you about. Uh, and by the way, that happened very precisely on 25th of August, 2012. The second story, uh, no less a uh, momentous occasion, uh, it is when we landed uh, Curiosity, a, a two-ton object on the surface of Mars. And uh, I think you will enjoy that. I would like to take you with me to the control room that night as we were preparing to hear that the rover has landed properly on the surface of Mars. And have you share in the excitement of what it was and what we were feeling as this thing was getting uh, ready to land. And that happened on the 6th of August, 2012. So those two first stories are things that have already happened in the past. The next two stories are things yet to come. Uh, they are at least a 10, decade, a, a, uh, 10 years in the future. One of them is uh, going to um, a moon of uh, Jupiter called Europa and get to the ocean underneath. And that is the best uh, potential for life outside of Earth, uh, a complex life outside of Earth. That, hopefully, if the government funds us, will happen and will happen in, in about 10 years. And finally, the last one, 
Um, a few of you remember a few months ago this asteroid that exploded uh, on, in, in Moscow. And so it, it's a reminder that we are vulnerable, that these things are out there, and in fact, they could uh, pose extinction uh, to the civilization. And I would like to tell you what it is that NASA is going to do to uh, potentially uh, you know, plan to save the Earth if we have sufficient advance warning. We, in fact, are going to go literally bag an asteroid in deep space and bring it back to the moon so that we can examine it. So those two would be my last two stories. And um, if you are interested, at the end, I'll be uh, able to take some questions as much as I can. So let's go to the first story. So being in London, right, and uh, acting as a tourist, <coughs> I'm um, trying to uh, act as a tour guide and, uh, and take you um, to a tour of the uh, solar system. So the first thing I'd like to do is to uh, introduce some uh, uh, metrics, right? So when I came from Los Angeles to uh, London, uh, the distance was uh, said to be about 9,000 kilometers. So for anything on Earth, kilometers are a good measure uh, to uh, measure distances. Even at the moon, the distance of the, uh, the Earth to the moon at 400,000 kilometers, still kilometer works. But unfortunately, once you get further out into the solar system and then beyond solar system, kilometer is not a good metric. You need a bigger yardstick because the distances are so immense. So people have introduced two new yardsticks. One of them is called an astronomical unit, or AU. Okay, and by definition, that is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's one AU. And then from there on, you talk about two AUs and three AUs and five AUs. And one AU is 150 million kilometers. You can see that when you want to take about you know, 100 AUs, you don't have to carry as many zeros with you. Just say 100 AU. So that also worked within the solar system. Now, when you get outside of the solar system, I mean, it just gets crazy very quickly. And so there, uh, you need a really, really large uh, yardstick. And what people have defined is the distance that light travels in one year. And that turns out to be 10 trillion kilometers. And so again, you can see when you want to say, you know, a 100 uh, uh, light years, right? And saying 110 tri trillion kilometers, you just say 100 light years. So remember the AU, remember the light years as we go forward. So when I say something is four AUs, don't take it too lightly. It is four, 10 trillion kilometers, but it's just uh, much more convenient to talk about it that way. Okay, so with that in mind, let's uh, first zoom out to see uh, the solar system. We happen to be in a galaxy called the Milky Way. The Milky Way is not only home to our sun, it is also home to 200 billion other stars. I hope you all understand that everything that you see in the night sky that we call stars, they're all suns, a form of suns. Some bigger, some smaller, some burn brighter, but nonetheless, in makeup, they're the same as the sun. It's farther away, so we see them a little like stars, but if you got close to them, it's just exactly like our sun. Okay, and our, our star, we have named sun. That's a proper name for our star. It's called the sun. So, Sun is one of the 200 billion stars in the uh, Milky Way, but was it always there? All right, so how was the Sun born? And regrettably, much like us, stars, uh, they have a birth, they live a mature life longer than you and I, but regrettably at the end, they also die. So our Sun is, uh, has a, a lifespan of about 10 million years, it is in uh, midlife, about uh, uh, five billion years, so you don't have to ruin your weekend. Nothing's going to happen uh, eminently. Uh, so let's first talk about how did the sun uh, uh, came to be. So in the Milky Way, the galaxy, in addition to all the stars, there are also a massive amount of hydrogen clouds. I mean, I was just looking outside, you know, in London sky, and I see, you know, all these puffy clouds, except now imagine that in a massive scale, 
in within the um, galaxy, there is a fair amount of um, uh, hydrogen cloud. Uh, there is one of it here, uh, that which uh, they have called cosmic caterpillar, for obvious reason, is about 10 trillion kilometers long, so which is light year, remember. So that's about a light year long. There at the, at the bottom is another example that's, a, uh, that's called an uh, eagle uh, nebula. By the way, nebula is the Latin name for cloud. So these are all clouds of gas interspersed between the stars in the galaxy. Okay, so it turns out that these are the birthplaces of, st uh, of suns, of stars. Something happens in the galaxy, maybe a trigger event, maybe a supernova goes off someplace and sets up a shock inside the galaxy and makes a part of this gas to collapse on itself. When it collapses on itself, it sets up a gravitational field and it attracts more and more gas onto itself. And so the next chart shows you the process of how this happens and how did the sun and all the planets around it where I came into being about 4.6 billion years ago. So imagine there now, if this is a part of that hydrogen gas that has collapsed on itself and starts attracting more and more gas. And as it does, a, a conservation of angular momentum would dictate that this thing starts spinning very fast around itself. And most of the mass goes into a central blob, central sphere that eventually became our sun. But about 1% went to, into a flat disk about that sphere. Much like the rings of Saturn, as you have seen, pretty much the same thing. So as time goes, uh, goes on, the uh, radiation from the sun starts blowing the gas out. And inside, you start emerging the planets. There are rocky um, planetesimal that collide with each other, they make a bigger blob, and then more and more, and eventually they grow into being the, uh, the rocky planets that we see inside. And the gas migrates out, and that is where the, uh, the gas giants are formed. So let's go take a look at that. Oh, uh, by the way, this uh, collisions that we talked about also is responsible for creation of the moon. Early on, in the uh, about 4.6 billion years ago, uh, when Jupiter and Saturn, the two big bullies in the solar system, form, they start throwing rocks all over the place, and a lot of them to the inner solar system, and start colliding with each other. And one of these collisions happens to be a a Mars-sized object, which collided with Earth, early Earth, ripped a good part of the Earth apart and scattered materials all over the place, and that material coalesced to become the moon that we see here today. So geologically, uh, cosmologically speaking, we can say that the sun, the planets, the moon were all born about the same time, uh, give or take 100 million years, which in this time scale it, it is, is nothing, but roughly, the event that led to the creation of the sun and the ring around it also is what gave birth the, uh, to the uh, solar system. So here is uh, our sun for different views. Our sun is uh, right now in, the, um, in uh, a mature state in middle age. Uh, it is um, 4.6 billion years uh, in age and probably would live another uh, um, uh, 5 billion years. So what happens is that at the end, when you have all the gases collapsing, at the core of the sun, the pressure gets so high and the temperature gets so high that essentially you start a thermonuclear reaction. So what sun is essentially is a thermonuclear uh, uh, reactor. And what happens is that you start taking four hydrogen atoms, and because of the temperature and pressure, fuse it together to get two helium atoms. And in that process, in that exchange, from hydrogen to helium, not all the mass transfers. A little bit of it is lost, but that's a very important loss because that 
uh, translates to energy through Einstein's famous equation. And that is the energy that sustains us. So this is, uh, you know, and if you want to find out the fuel consumption of the, uh, of the sun, it consumes uh, 700 million tons of hydrogen a second. And it's been doing it for 5 billion years. And we'll do it for another 5 billion years. And you might say, my God, this is a, you know, it's a horrible diet. You know, you know, that's much, uh, that much long. But uh, the fact of the matter is that the sun is so large that at the end of 10 billion years, it would have lost only 1% of its mass, even you know, going at that rate. But so the, the, the loss, uh, need to correct something. So you are burning 700 million tons of uh, hydrogen to make helium, and in that exchange, 5,000 uh, 5, tons is lost, and that's the energy that we receive. And that's fairly important because, of course, if we weren't getting that energy, none of us would be, uh, would be around here. Okay, so now let's go talk about the rest of the solar system. So in the inner solar system, you have your four rocky planets. You have Mercury, you have Venus, you have Earth, and you have Mars. And as you remember, I said when the sun starts radiating, it pushed the gas out. So what remained in the inner solar system were all these rocky, uh, all these rocks, which aggregated together to form the, uh, the uh, four rocky planets that you see here. The gas then migrated out, and they, they formed the two gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn were formed because the hydrogen, the radiation, you know, blew the, uh, the hydrogen out and, uh, you know, f uh, uh, formed that. And then even, uh, oh, this is a, a cool picture I wanted to show you. This is a remarkable picture that uh, was taken a few months ago. We have a spacecraft uh, that's orbiting uh, Saturn and uh, took this uh, image from the back of Saturn looking towards the, uh, the inner solar system. And so Saturn is about 10 AU away uh, from the sun. And you can see how Earth would look uh, from 10 AU. And even more remarkable, if you take a look at with a, uh, a telescopic lens, you can see both the Earth and the moon uh, in a single shot. And that's, uh, you know, that's what it looks like. So let's go further beyond Saturn. Beyond Saturn, now you get to the point where we have the two ice giants because the, uh, the water condenses and uh, you, know, you have ices and you go ahead and you form the, um, uh, the, the two planets, uh, uh, Uranus, Uranus and Neptune. So might that be the boundary of the solar system? You have the eight planets, uh, that's the uh, end of the planet line. And uh, so might that be it? And I'll uh, suggest not. But I also want to tell you that there could have been another planet that really didn't form. And that one is a collection of rocky objects in between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. They would have, there, there's uh, many millions of them, they would have coalesced into another planet in between Mars and Jupiter. But the Jupiter's gravity didn't allow these to come together. So what happens then? What we have now in the uh, somewhere between the orbit, the large orbit out there, uh, um, blue is Jupiter, and uh, the next one is Mars, and in between there are millions of rocky objects. Now keep that in mind because when I get to my fourth story and tell you about the pot, the possibility of Earth getting impacted by a rocky object, that's where they would come from. They would come from the asteroid belt which somehow gravitationally they got disturbed and they were hurled toward Earth and you know and there may be an unlucky uh, collision between one of these things and, 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 the, um, and the Earth. Okay, so let's move further out. You remember that there was, uh, depending on how old you are, you remember that at one time there were nine planets and uh, Pluto was uh, a few years ago demoted uh, from being a planet to a, uh, a uh, uh, smaller, uh, smaller object. Uh, and uh, so 
then surely Pluto maybe is the boundary. Okay, but in 1992, we found out that beyond the orbits of the planets, there are another belt, not the asteroid belt, but another belt which is called Kuiper Belt. Kuiper Belt has about 100,000 um, uh, objects which are 100 kilometers or larger. And in fact, Pluto was determined to belong to that belt as opposed to being a proper planet. And therefore, it was the <coughs> object. Uh, so if you take a look at that, then uh, you have your uh, inner planets. And then you come out, and somewhere in about 30 to 50 AUs, you have about 100,000 of these objects, OK, circling the sun. Well, then maybe that is the boundary. OK, so now we have accounted for all the planets. We have accounted for the Kuiper belt. So maybe that is the boundary. But not, that's not the definition of that uh, the uh, uh, scientists uh, uh, describe. So let me now go to, I need to, uh, to uh, introduce another topic before we can talk about the boundary of the solar system. And that is something else that's called solar wind. The sun, the outer la layers of the sun get so hot that the atoms of hydrogen, they gain so much kinetic energy that can actually reach escape velocity and leave the sun and you know spread forward. And there are millions of tons of hydrogen that sun also loses through this uh, solar wind that propagates in all directions. Now, it is this which I'll tell you in the next slide defines, at least one definition, the boundary of the solar system. And that is, if you take a look at the sun in the middle and the solar wind expanding in all directions and going forward, right? It reaches a point where winds from the outside of the solar system, from other stars and from other cosmic rays, are blowing inside, inward, and the two winds meet, and the, sol the cosmic winds stop the solar wind and they turn it around. Okay, and some people say, well, that is the definition because that's the place where the sun sort of peters out, if you will. And the, uh, if you take a look at the solar wind as the outermost atmosphere of the sun, it went as far as it could before it got stopped by this incoming solar wind. And it turns out that that is a 122 AUs away uh, from, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the sun. And that boundary, ironically, is measurable because you can uh, sense a change in the magnetic field when it crosses this boundary. It's like uh, throwing a switch. And so on the 25th of August, 2012, the scientists decided that a, the spacecraft that we have sent, which had in, uh, on it instrumentation to measure cosmic winds and measure the change in the magnet, uh, magnetic field, that you know we have crossed that threshold. And now Voyager is in the, uh, uh, in the, in the solar system. So um, uh, today, uh, the, um, uh, the Voyager is at 122 AU. Uh, I'm sorry, 125, because it, it, uh, it, it is speeding away from the sun at the rate of 3.6 AU a year. So a year has gone by, and it is about 125 AU away. So we have solved the definition of the boundary of the solar system, or have we? OK, not necessarily, right? So the scientists, with a uh, you know, fair bit of excitement, defined where the solar wind stops. And they said, that is the, the boundary. And we have crossed and you know, applause and, you know, and all of that. And it, it, to, to be uh, sure, it is a momentous occasion. But outside of that, there are still trillions of objects which are gravitationally bound to the sun. And in fact, they are in a sphere, a bubble around the sun, called the Oort cloud. 
that is somewhere between 50,000 to 100,000 AU extends out, and which is uh, roughly about one light year, right? So one definition of where is the end of the solar system is at a point where nothing else gets attracted to the sun. It's not gravitationally bound to the sun. And so in that definition, then of course we have long to go. Because remember, I said the Voyager has crossed the threshold at 122 AU, and we are talking about 100,000 AU. So now, what and beyond that? and that's where I want to stop and end the first, um, the first story, is that beyond that, the closest star to us, to the sun, is a star uh, combination called Alpha Centauri, which is about 4.36 um, light years away from the sun. So now we send this object away, and we launched it 37 years ago. I would like to give you the sense of distances and how long will it take Voyager to get to the closest star to us. I mean, this is like your neighbor that you go knock on the door and say, can I borrow a cup of sugar? It is the closest star to the sun next to us, right? And so looking at a Voyager, which was launched in 1977, today is about 125 AU away, and it is speeding, screaming away from the sun at an incredible velocity of 60,000 kilometers per second is receding from the sun. At that velocity, it would take Voyager 70,000 years to get to our closest neighbor, to the closest sun. So, uh, you know, the, at least at this point, the idea of human travel. I mean, Hollywood does it all the time, right? <laughs> in Hollywood, you, you know, you go from one place, you know, if, if you saw the movie Contact, you know, and they introduce the wormhole, and, you know, and it makes for a good story. But uh, today, we don't know of any technology that would allow us to travel to another star, even the closest one, the one right next to us. Okay, so that's uh, the end of my first uh, story. I hope you got a sense of the, uh, the magnificence of the solar system and the fantastic distances that is uh, involved in, the, um, uh, in, in uh, space travel. So the second story I want to tell you is um, something near and dear to my heart because when we started um, the uh, Curiosity at the time, I was still the uh, director of the Mars program uh, that wasn't there for its maturing. So I want to tell you about uh, Mars program a little bit and about the landing of Curiosity, which happened 6th of August two, uh, 2012. So the objective of the Mars program is to, in fact, find out if the environment of Mars was ever conducive to emergence of life. Was the conditions on Mars just like the conditions on Earth when Earth first uh, you know, brought about biology? Was it the same on Mars? And second, if it was conducive, it's not a given that life actually arose on Mars. So the second question, given that the Mars was habitable, did life in fact emerge? And then the third question is, if it did, might it be there in some form? We of course know all that on Mars there are not a life form, complex life form like us. But I, not in today's lecture, but when I normally talk about how life came to be on Earth, it is such an amazing story of how life came uh, about on Earth. And if, in fact, on the, our tiny solar system, I talked about all the distances and billions of stars, if on our tiny solar system this thing happened twice in a single solar system, we're just a speck. It happened on Earth and it happened some, somewhere else. Then the probability that life might happen elsewhere in the universe, you know, the probability just, just goes up. So I, I want to also, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about uh, you know, how life came about on Earth, but I thought I, I would include two or three slides to just give you a sense. 
the, um, if, to, to put it in perspective, I'll put it on a dial tone here. Uh, 12 is 4.6 billion years ago. That's when I said the sun and the planets and the moon and everything else came into being. And so if you start going around the, you know, clockwise around the face, around the dial, the earliest uh, chemical evidence that we have uh, that, uh, uh, that the, you know, the, the first form of biology goes to about 3.8 billion years ago. That's when the bombardment of the Earth stopped. That's when Jupiter and Saturn settled in their position. They weren't hurling all these things, you know, to, uh, to uh, um, uh, collide with the Earth. That, you know, shortly after that, we have evidence that life rose very early uh, in that. And then by the time you get to 3.2 billion years ago, we actually have microfossil evidence of early life. Now, continue going around the, um, a, around the dial. At about 2.7 billion years ago, we believe that the first cell without, uh, uh, without a nucleus was born. And really, it wasn't all the way up to about 650 million years ago, which is very recent. Again, look at the dial clock. You know, it's always at about 1030. Uh, that you got this explosion of life, the way that we see it, the plants and the animals, animals and the humans and all of that. And so you may ask the question, what happened? What happened 650 million years ago? For billions of years, you have these microorganisms running around Earth, and then 650 million years ago, you had this explosion. And so if this was another talk, I would have told you that it had to do with the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere it reached a tipping point. You need oxygen to provide the energy required for complex life, for much more complex life. So the concentration of oxygen in, on Earth reached a level where it gave rise to, um, uh, to uh, the complex life form that we know. And you have to go back to about 230 million years ago, which is, again, pretty close to midnight now, or noon, or whatever you want to call it, uh, that's where the dinosaurs roamed the earth. And again, related to my last talk, you will see that the dinosaurs ruled the earth for 160 million years before one of these asteroids made an extent. And the question is, we better find the asteroids before they find us. <laughs> and so that's what we will be talking about. So anyway, you can see that you know this amazing complexity of life that we find here on Earth today. They all came from this microorganism uh, that was uh, uh, on Earth uh, 3.8 billion years ago. And in fact, you know, you all have your family trees. You can, particularly in England, you, you always know, uh, you know how your ancestry goes. Uh, and uh, so all living forms also can be related back to that original life form, the micro uh, organism uh, on Earth some years ago. You can see where we are, uh, and uh, just in case we are you know, too arrogant, you can see that your shower mold, basically not that many few branches away from you. So we are all we are all related. Okay. So suppose we go to Mars. Okay, and I'll tell you how difficult it is in a minute. So suppose we go to Mars. How are we going? I mean, there's no Wikipedia on Mars. There's no <laughs> library or internet. How are you going to find out what happened on Mars hundreds of millions of years ago? Right? It turns out that the history of Mars is written in its rocks, in its soil. Uh, I don't know the analogy here in UK, but in US, for example, when you go to Grand Canyon and you, you can see the bands in the soil, each one of the bands um, tells it's almost like a page in a history book in the hands of a um, geologist who can read rocks. They can tell you what the environment was like when the, uh, that particular strata was formed. So the best way to actually find out what happened on Mars is to send a geologist to Mars. Okay. And so, you know, what the geologists typically do, they go to the field, 
They take up a rock, they take a hammer, they crack it open, they put a lens to it, they take it to the laboratory, they grind it, they, you know, they do analysis on it, and with some remarkable precision, they will tell you what happened in that location where that rock was formed. So that's the best thing to do. But unfortunately, we cannot send a geologist to Mars. Four reasons. Uh, first of all, it takes approximately seven months to go to Mars. And then you cannot come back on will. Okay, you have to wait for the planets to align to come back again. It could take as long as three years round trip. And the radiation will do a wonder with your biological cells. So biologically, we cannot send humans to Mars and guarantee their safe return. So that's one. The second is, is technological. The uh, most massive things that we have landed on Mars, which is what I'm going to talk to you about, Curiosity, was two tons. A ton for the uh, lander and then a ton for the things that put it down uh, on the ground. In order to land humans on Mars, we need to land 40 tons on Mars. Even on view graph, on paper, we don't know how to do that yet. So technologically, we're not ready. Biologically, we're not ready. Technologically, we're not ready. And one of them, which may sound like a soft science to you, is psychological. You know, when people went to the moon, Earth was there. You could see it. This big, beautiful blue planet was there. You could see it. That's where home was. When you go to Mars, Earth was going to be seen you know, like a speck. And you are in this capsule with three other people, which you, know, you may not like at the end of the first two months. Okay. And, and some people have suggested that, well, maybe we should set couples. <laughs> and so I, I leave that your imagination, you know, whether that's a wise thing to do. Uh, so there is a psychological issue of isolating humans from other humans from the planet for such a long period of time. And the last one is very practical, it is financial. It is estimated that it might cost a good part of a trillion dollars to mount a human campaign to Mars. I'm convinced that if we someday go to Mars, we're not going to go as Americans or Brits or Chinese or Russians. It's going to be the people of planet Earth <laughs> going to Mars. It's going to require the collaboration between nations to be able to pull something so momentous and, and, and get it off the ground. So for now, since we cannot send a human biologist, what we end up, we send a robot biologist. That is what we build. Where I work in NASA, we just do only robotic things. We don't send, uh, uh, we don't work with astronauts. Okay, we only, and our robots have wheels, just like we have legs. They have eyes to see where they want to go. We have given them arms. And it has a shoulder joint and an elbow joint and it has a wrist joint and instead of fingers, we have given it instruments. It can drive next to a rock, put the instruments on it, and tell the geologist back at Earth what it is that it's seeing. So it becomes a proxy for, uh, for humans. And so I'm biased, right? I work in, uh, in a center of NASA that only does uh, uh, robotics, not human biologists. But you must admit that it does have certain uh, advantages. You don't have any kind of biological <laughs> issues you know, with robots. No work uh, And uh, so with that in mind, I'd like to show you a, uh, a again, tongue-in-cheek, uh, a one-minute uh, uh, video that says, why do we prepare, rob uh, prepare robots uh, to astronauts? competition between us uh, at JPL who work on uh, robotic uh, exploration and JSC which uh, you know serves them. Now I, I, to be honest with you you know if they were not astronauts you wouldn't survive. You know you need the symbiosis between astronauts and robotics.
to get the people excited about space exploration because people at the end might uh, relate more to a human than they would do to a robot. But, you know, I must tell you, the robots that I managed that landed on Mars in 2004 spares an opportunity. There was a suggestion that uh, people actually started planning in NASA what happens when one of these things stops working. And we had a meetings about how to communicate this to many children around the world who had come to view this thing as a person. Uh, you know, and, and people tend to relate uh, to, uh, to these robots after a while. So uh, this one is the, um, the uh, uh, spacecraft that we landed in 2006. It is by far the most complicated robotic spacecraft that uh, humans have built. And it was the, uh, both transferring it to Mars and then landing it on Mars which I'm going to try to describe to you uh, in, in a minute. So first of all, we uh, you, you need something to carry it uh, to Mars. You fold it and you put it inside a capsule. So that rover is here. You'll see this uh, delivery system in a second. And you close it, and that is the spacecraft that will carry it, uh, carry it to Mars. And you will see in a movie I'm going to show in a second how the whole process works. So one other thing is that uh, the, the question is, can you book a flight to Mars anytime that you want? It turns out, no, that's not uh, the way you could do it. In, um, here's the orbit of the Earth going around the Sun. The uh, dotted one is the orbit of Mars going around the Sun. You cannot launch a spacecraft to Mars anytime that you want. We'll wait for an opportune time that comes around every 26 months. And in that 26 months, you have 21 days, a window of 21 days, to launch something uh, uh, to Mars. And so it takes about five years to build one of these things. So imagine you start a project five years ahead of time, and you need to make sure that you finish it in that 21-day window. You know, sometimes when we have, God bless us, uh, you know, Iranian events, and you know you invite people and they invariably come an hour late and you say you know what happened oh you know i had to my kids and my laundry and, and all of that and so you couldn't plan this thing one day ahead of time and here you know you you have to do really um uh, plan so that you would land you would launch in a 21 day window five years ahead of time now so the obvious thing is say okay so you wait for them to get close and then you launch. As it turns out, it's counterintuitive. You cannot make a beeline from Earth to Mars in a short distance like this, because Earth is moving like so. And the most fuel efficient way to launch a spacecraft to Mars is to launch it in the same direction that Earth is going. So you, you never launch the spacecraft to Mars is. You launch it to where Mars is going to be, right? So those of you who play soccer or you play, you know, American football, you see that, you know, often the guy who is passing the ball doesn't pass it to the individual, pass it to where he thinks the, the football player is going to be. So the ball and the player arrive, you know, if the pass is very good, ar arrive at the same location at the same time. So that's basically what we do. We launch a spacecraft uh, that will meet up with Mars, uh, you know, ahead of time. So the question here is how exactly, I mean, you know, when the scientists say you want to go to Mars, they're not going to celebrate you just because you hit the planet Mars. They want to go to a specific place. Right? If somebody wants to come to visit London, it doesn't help if you land in Brazil, <laughs> right? So it is really a very precision. You have to target a place on Mars when you want to land the spacecraft. And I want to, uh, I don't know if that's the next uh, slide. Yes, it is. So my cousin Alex here is a footballer, right? And I assume that sometime during his place, he kicks a corner kick, right? So the way it is to give you an, an analogy, it is like kicking a corner uh, kick from Cairo. 
and not only hitting England, not only hitting London, it's hitting Wimbledon, uh, Wembley Stadium, and in fact, to scoring a goal. So that is basically the precision that we need to have in order to land the spacecraft where we want it to land. And you want to have a little bit more fun. You know, now, we have for added fun, the stadium move at about 60,000 miles per hour, which is what the case is with Mars. Right? So I have immense uh, respect for our navigators that navigate our spacecraft to Mars and land it really within precision that the only way I can tell you what it is is to make you feel and something that you may encounter uh, you know, in life, which is uh, an analogy with soccer. So uh, as difficult as it is to get to Mars, <coughs> That's the easiest part of the journey. The thing that kills you is the last seven minutes. That is the difficulty of landing on Mars. Because you are approaching Mars at an incredible velocity of 20,000 kilometers per hour. You hit the top of the atmosphere at about 80 kilometers, uh, 125 kilometers. And seven minutes later, one way or the other, you're going to be on the surface. You either gently land on the surface, or you have two and a half billion crater that you generated with this thing smashing, smashing down. It is how you put the brake system on something which is going 20,000 kilometers an hour. You know, I, I don't know, a Ferrari, I don't know what's the top speed of Ferrari, you know, uh, maybe 200, 250. Uh, you know, kilometers per hour. And so at 20,000, you need one incredible set of brake systems to slow this thing down so that it would gently land on the surface of Mars. And we do it in stages. So um, in here, on the first panel, you see this is the, uh, the spacecraft that took the capsule to Mars. And once it gets there, we have no use for it. It releases the capsule. And the capsule goes into the Mars atmosphere. Even though Mars atmosphere is very thin, it is about 1% of the Earth. Nonetheless, it has some friction and it will slow the, the capsule as it barrels through the atmosphere. Of course, it gets very hot in the front, 3,000 degrees. And unless you have a heat shield, it's going to burn up. OK, so you give it a heat shield to make sure that uh, it will survive. When it slows down to supersonic um, uh, stages, then you open up a, um, a parachute. And then towards the end, in the movie that you will see, we, we use different uh, means of actually gently landing it on Mars. I'm going to show you a movie. It's about three minutes. And it's going to show you the last three times that we landed on Mars. For different reasons, we have used three different techniques. All these three have happened. What you will see is animation, of course, because we don't have CNN or BBC on Mars you know, uh, uh, looking at the, at the landing. But uh, the first one is when I was the uh, Mars director. And you will see, when we get to the surface of Mars, we put it in an airbag. And we bounced it on the surface of Mars until it came to a stop, just like a basketball. and then deflated the airbag in all of it, the rover emerged. The second one is a spacecraft that we landed in the, near the Northern Pole, uh, high latitudes of Mars. And that one, we did it <coughs> propulsively all the way down. You know, we used jet engines to slow it down all the way down. And the last one, this being UK, is a bit more James Bondish. You will see it. I mean. Even us, uh, you know, we're crossing our fingers that this thing is going to work. And uh, so I'm not going to add any commentary and let you enjoy it. Uh, so you will see three different uh, landing on Mars. Uh, and all three, in fact, have happened. And fortunately for us, all three of them successfully. Oh, before doing that, I thought some of you guys might have seen him on television, the Mohawk guy, who <laughs> became a sensation. Uh, he, uh, after the night that we landed, he got 300 marriage proposal. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the day after, you know, Obama called us, uh, you know, to congratulate him and asked for him. He said that, you know, I wanted to get a Mohawk, but Michelle didn't let me because of the <laughs> marriage proposals and all that. So he's still a celebrity. And, 
you know, became an overnight uh, sensation. All right, so let's take a look at the movie. sponsors of course are NASA headquarters in Washington and they come for the landing and they see this explosion of uh, emotions that been bottled up for five years not knowing whether it's gonna work or not and at the end they look at us with surprise and say you actually didn't expect this thing to work <laughs> <laughs> and they think we took liberty with their two and a half million dollars but so fortunately I, I think it has and so to wrap up my uh, uh, this segment, I would like to just show you. It's just amazing images. I mean, this looks like you might have taken, uh, y you know, on uh, um, on one of your field trips here on Earth, but it's actually is the uh, image of Mars. So let me. Um, the last two stories that are coming, they're shorter stories. Uh, the first one I want to tell you about is uh, traveling deep inside uh, Europa's ocean. So Europa is one of the moons of Jupiter, and I've lost count. It has 60-some-odd moons. And like Earth, which has only one, Jupiter has 60-some-odd moons. 
And this is a very special moon because uh, it is, of course, outside of it is completely frozen, maybe kilometers of ice. But underneath, the scientists speculate that this tiny moon has three times as much water as all of the oceans on Earth, right? And again, for a reason I will not go into, uh, liquid water, as we, life as we know it, is, is a requirement. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to uh, go to uh, Europa, and as you will see, the, uh, I don't know whether you guys know James Cameron is a uh, movie producer in the U.S., the, the guy who uh, produced Titanic and produced Avatar, you might have seen the movies. He turns out to be a movie buff. Uh, and not a movie buff, a science buff. I mean, he's a you know, movie director by, by profession. And so what you will see, he has produced a one-minute movie about how we may go to Europa. And it's remarkably accurate, except for the last few seconds that he couldn't help himself and he went Hollywood. <laughs> but uh, the first part of it, uh, you know, I, I actually, that's something that we may do if we get enough money from Congress. Uh, so take a look at uh, this thing. It sends a lander to the surface of Europa, and it erects what we call the melt probe. It has a nuclear head that melts its way through the ice, goes underneath, and releases a submarine, which communicates back to the mothership with a sonar, and tries to explore and see what might be uh, in a uh, surf, you know, underneath the ocean. So uh, let's take a look. Matt has to sell tickets, so I don't, <laughs> I don't envy him that. And uh, so I'm, I'm guessing that a, a mission like that would probably cost somewhere between two to three billion dollars. Uh, and uh, you know, if we can convince the uh, uh, the uh, NASA headquarters to give us a fund, uh, it's something doable in the 2020s. Okay, I've saved the last uh, story. Uh, to be something more tangible. You know, we can talk about Europa and landing on Mars. There is nothing like, you know, an asteroid coming and landing on your roof that would get you excited. <laughs> so, uh, in the last story, I want to talk about how realistic it is that an asteroid will actually collide with Earth and what damage it may cause, and is it preventable? Okay, so let's go to the last story. Um, and uh, so I've turned it bagging an asteroid because at the end I will tell you about the mission that we're working on right now. Uh, we will see in about a month whether the president uh, put any money uh, in this mission um, for 2015. So, um, you know, you saw this before. I told you that there is a lot of leftover pieces from the formation of the solar system. I don't know if you have ever made something for your kid maybe something that comes in a kit, you know, like a bicycle or a dollhouse. You get all the pieces and you put it together and by the time you're finished and it looks like a you know, finished product, you look around and there's all lef leftover pieces. <laughs> and you're in a saying, you know, now where did I miss to put the screws and what have you? And so these are all the leftover pieces 
from when the solar system was formed, all these rocks. Once in a while, uh, you know, and they could be um, uh, very tiny, or they could be kilometers long. And because of some gravitational uh, perturbation, so long as they're going in a circle around the sun, we're safe. But once in a while, something happens that one of these things gets out of the orbit and gets hurled toward the inner solar system. And bad things will happen if the orbit that it follows, and you can see that's the green orbit, and the Earth orbit is the blue orbit, if it just so happens that their orbits intersect, and it happens that the two objects, the planet and the asteroid, happen to be at that exact position, at that intersection, that is where, where the things happen. So what's the, uh, what's the probability? So first of all, we know that in the um, 65 million years ago, there was a mass extinction that um, killed off all the, uh, the uh, asteroids. There is a um, uh, Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where there is evidence that something very large, maybe 10, 11 kilometers in size, collided with Earth uh, 65 million years ago. And for you to get a sense of what does it mean for something 11 kilometers to collide with Earth, take a look at this thing. It is the energy of setting off a Hiroshima event <coughs> every second for 120 years. The aggregate energy of all of that is the energy that the Earth experienced with that impact. Of course, it is not just whatever is under me. I mean, you sort of figure away, it's 11 kilometers, so wherever it hits, all the unfortunate people who happen to be in that location. No, it actually puts so much massive amount of dust in a globe around the Earth that blocks out the sun. And so it's not only the energy right away, but the fact that you would uh, lose the uh, sun energy, which is uh, required and would take it, uh, a, a lot of uh, years for, for that uh, dust to go away. So we know that this thing ha happened. So if something about that size, 11 kilometer in size, and there are objects, I'll show you uh, how many, uh, that if uh, uh, collides with Earth, civilization as we know it today will not exist. That's the same. And the dinosaurs were around for 170 million years. So they were pretty persistent before this thing happened to them. So let me give you a sense of how much of these things are there anyway. More than a kilometer, there are about a thousand of this. Uh, and Congress actually chartered NASA to track all asteroids greater than a particular size, and the table comes from them and from the models, right? So we know about 95% of these big bad boys. We have tracked about 95% of them, and we know, you know where they are. And the frequency, again, based on model, maybe about every million years, you would have a chance of getting impacted by something like that. Next in size is 300 meters to about a kilometer. If that one hits, you would have a, uh, you would have a continental catastrophe. If one of those hits, Europe would no longer be, right? And there are about 5,000 of those, and about 60% of those have been detected and cataloged. And once we catalog them, we, you know, we monitor their orbits and know where they're going. And uh, something of that magnitude is expected to hit the Earth every 40,000 years. Then next scale down is 100 meters to 300 meters. That will have a regional impact. If one of them hits, England will no longer be. Uh, sorry for picking on Europe and England. It's just I thought that it would relate to the geography a little bit better uh, if I use a uh, uh, local language here. And we have detected only 10% of these. And every 10,000 years is expected to get an event like that. And then finally, in 30 meters to 100 meters, that would be a local event, a city. We would call these city killers something like that. And there is a million of those. And we know only two-tenths of a percent of these. Right? 
So, you know, the, the scales, I mean, uh, for those of us who plan our next vacation for next summer, you know, 300 years sounds like a, you know, I mean, it's not my problem. I, I'm not going to be around in 300 years. But I think if you are, you are a custodian of the planet, you know, it's, uh, it, it is uh, up to you to be able to detect. And, and so let's take a look at some of these events that have happened. So this thing happened in northern Russia uh, early last century in June of uh, 1908 and leveled 720 square kilometers of trees. Fortunately, uh, and, and, and that's by the way, it's estimated to be about uh, 30 to 40 meters and it exploded uh, before it hit the ground and it was the shock that uh, did the damage. So for you to get a sense of you know, what is a 720 square kilometer, if it had hit a metropolitan area, okay, London is 600 square miles. Okay, one of the, if that thing, rather than hitting fortuitously in an area which was, ha uh, was a dense population, it could have wiped out an entire metropolitan area. And that happened uh, about 100 years ago. So uh, that's this. That's this size, about 30 meters, which, uh, as we said, there is a, a million of them, and we know only about 2% two, uh, two of them. So this thing now happened, uh, in, this is another one, in 1992. Uh, so a Volkswagen-sized asteroid hits the Earth every six months. So fortunately, it never makes it down because it breaks up in the atmosphere. It's coming in with such a velocity that it just breaks apart in the atmosphere. And, you know, it, it does not do major damage. Uh, except in this particular case, uh, this uh, young lady, uh, Michelle Knapp, uh, had her uh, Malibu, uh, I think it's 1991, uh, that uh, you know got hit by an asteroid, a piece of the asteroid. That thing broke into a seven, uh, 70 pieces. But one of them, her, this is in New Jersey, uh, landed in her Malibu. So uh, feeling sure that she has insurance, she took the car to the insurance company and demanded, and they said, oh, but we don't cover act of God. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end, it turned out that she uh, actually did quite well because she sold the Astro, the, uh, the, the, the fragment, and the car for $70,000 <laughs> and uh, you know, recouped her money. So this is the latest one. Uh, this is the one that happened in Moscow, uh, what, four months ago, five months ago, right? And, uh, Chelyabinsk uh, Airbus uh, happens on uh, February 15th, uh, 2013. It was 9 a.m. local time. And it, it was fairly shallow, so you could um, observe the trajectory. And for some reason, uh, you know, most cars in Soviet Union had a camera on it. So there is a lot of people recorded this event. Uh, it, this is a good side of. I, I suppose spying on people. <laughs> but, uh, so there is a, scientifically a lot of uh, uh, record of what happened uh, that day. And that thing also <laughs> exploded in the air. And uh, the shock wave broke a lot of windows, but there were no fatality in that particular case. Uh, so the last piece actually hit a, you know, the, the trajectory uh, hit a lake which was frozen over and uh, Recently, I uh, heard that uh, they have actually uh, uh, excavated the biggest fragment uh, you, you know, you know, that you see there, and other pieces already are uh, museum pieces. So you say, how come, we didn't, you know, how come we didn't see this coming? Well, for two reasons. First, it was small, and it's hard to detect small people. And the other thing that here's the sun on this end, and this thing was coming, through, uh, coming to us in the direction of the sun. And as you know, telescopes typically don't look at the sun. You look away from the sun because it ruins your telescopes. So it was, came from the place where we were not looking. Uh, and uh, so th that could happen. 
so I, I, you know, I, I think it's all a uh, uh, matter of perspective and uh, <laughs> whether these are good things or bad things. <laughs> So, Alex, nothing is going to happen before tomorrow, so don't, <laughs> don't get any ideas. All right, so uh, I have two more slides uh, to show you. Uh, it deals with what we're going to do to better understand these asteroids. We're actually going to send a spaceship uh, deep in the uh, solar system. We're going to give it a air, uh, give it a back. It's going to go and embrace the asteroid just like you do with your trash, that you put the trash in them and then draw the strings, you know, the uh, uh, closing the trash bag. That's what we're going to do. This is what it's going to look like. We're going to look for about a, a thousand ton asteroid. That's the spacecraft. We're going to go rendezvous with it. We're going to synchronize our, our rotation with the asteroid and then go and embrace the asteroid and pull the string and then bring the asteroid, well, we're not gonna bring the asteroid, the asteroid is gonna go where it wants to go. Uh, we're gonna ride along with it, but as it's coming toward the Earth, we're going to modify its trajectory ever so slightly, so when it gets to the moon, it gets gravitationally captured by the moon and goes into orbit around the moon, and in a stable orbit, don't have to worry about it, uh, and then it stays there, and then the astronauts can go rendezvous with it and examine it, understand better its composition, and so forth. So my last slide for tonight is a video of what that mission might look like as we go and rendezvous with this uh, astro. some sense of why I'm not bored with it yet. Uh, in, in general, people in, you know, ask me, it, it's almost always at the end of a lecture like this, people say, very exciting, you know, you know, God bless you, this is all very good. But we have homeless, we have hungry people, we have diseases, okay? Why are you spending money on these kind of endeavors where it could be spent much more uh, effectively here on Earth uh, addressing some of these societal needs. And, you know, my response to it is, first of all, uh, a great society shouldn't have to choose. And if you take a look at it, and I say this thing with utmost respect for people who work in social endeavors, we should and we must put priority on feeding the hungry, providing shelter for the homeless, solving cancer, solving AIDS. But if you really think about it, if you want to propel civilization through centuries by just taking care of the people at a time, it doesn't add much to the knowledge of the human being. It is the curiosity. It is what is around the corner. Why am I not seeing around the corner? This is what propels people. This is what enables breakthroughs. This is what all the explorers have done in, in the past. So I grant you that for the moment, 
it appears very lopsided when you talk about the urgency of the societal needs. But if you take a longer perspective, as a great civilization, a great civilization should, I think you need to balance not only societal needs, but also uh, the, uh, you know, the discoveries that may uh, lie ahead. So for now, you know, uh, the, uh, our job, the uh, Odyssey uh, continues. We will uh, push ahead with uh, these kind of missions that, uh, that you have seen. I uh, highlighted for you two of them, and there are many more. And with that, I would like to uh, uh, thank you for spending part of your afternoon with me. Thank you very much. Homer, you Renick, you achieve a lot, but how you are going to save it because with all this science, it proves nature is stronger than any knowledge we have now. For future generation, if you want to save the civilization, creative history, how you are going to save us, how you are going to collect all this information which is not going to be destroyed by action of nature or God, whatever you call it. Yeah, so the, so the question was that, you know, we do all these things and we accumulate the knowledge, but how are we going to save uh, us from us or us from the nature? And so, uh, again, uh, I would suggest to you there are different ways that we can end it all. I mean, either through conflicts uh, and, uh, you know, God forbid that... Uh, uh, the humans themselves destroy each other. So I have basically no answer to that. I leave that to the politicians, you know, on how to, de uh, to save us from that disaster. It could be a natural disaster, like I talked about, an asteroid impacting, and as I told you, there are plans to at least plan ahead and find out, is there a way, if you know it's coming your way, are there technologies to divert it ever so slightly so that rather than impacting the Earth, it goes by the Earth. And then the other uh, things that uh, you talked about, I didn't uh, mention here because I work in space exploration, space science, is the question of are we doing damage to the environment through global warming? And the, uh, there is a uh, almost unanimity among the Earth scientists that we indeed are, except I believe the interest of the business is not quite aligned with the uh, taking the measures to uh, reduce the, uh, the uh, uh, greenhouse gases. So each one of these things that could have catastrophic impact to Earth has a different solution. Uh, you know, us not blowing each other up with nuclear, that basically in the realms of the politicians and hope they do their jobs. You know, as I, I'm trying to stop the global warming, it is for the earth scientists to put all the warning signs out and have the politicians have the courage to pass the laws and the policies to uh, you know, stop uh, greenhouse gases. And for some of the natural disasters, like asteroids, uh, I think we're doing due diligence to make sure that we will prevent them. Yeah. My name is Muhammad Ali of Senecoon. I have to start to ask you a question. You be the first one to know if there's any bike exists outside these planets. And how would you uh, come to track with any life possibly outside the Earth? If you would see that harmful or friendly, you know. Um, probably that question might sound a bit bizarre, but uh, it might exist. How would you interact with the other life, you know, outside? Thank you. So, um, Absent any knowledge, I'll give you statistics. Uh, so the question is, what is the likelihood that there would be a life of one form and the, uh, or the other outside the, uh, the Earth? So you remember in my second slide, I showed you that the sun is one of 200 billion stars in the galaxy, the Milky Way. 200 billion other suns just like ours. And then in a universe, there are more than 100 billion galaxies. 
And again, the numbers is so incredible that I need to give you a sense for it. What does that mean? And I would say, go to a local beach, maybe Brighton, take a um, bag with you, make it a large bag, bend down and pick a grain of sand and put it in the bag and start counting. One and two and three and four until you clear all of the local beaches from all the grains of sands that you could pick and put inside the bag. And then do that all around Great Britain. And then do that all mm -hmm. around Europe. Yeah. And then, in fact, go ahead and count every grain of sand in all the beaches on the planet Earth. It turns out that there are more suns in the universe than there are grains of sand in all the beaches in the world. Now, so take your shoes off, walk in the sand. There is a little grain of sand in front of your toe. Pick it up and look at it. What makes you think that that grain of sand is different than all the grains of sands around you? So you have to be horribly self-centered to say that our grain of sand, the sun, is the only one among all the grains of sands in the world that has a property, that has a planet, that is rotating around in a particular orbit, which, you know, which has liquid water, and is habitable. So if you ask me, I think statistical odds for having life form may be even more advanced than, than us here. It, it, is, it has to be astronomical. Now, the other part that would get sober you up is the other slide that I showed that is going to take us 70,000 years with the current technology to get to the closest grain of sand. Not the one is in front of your toe, but the one right next to it. Let alone, you know, all the grains of sand in all the beaches. So the probability high, but uh, for now, uh, you know, I'm at loss to say, you, you know, how, uh, I mean, there are things like um, uh, movie um, contact where, in fact, you are listening that the civilization, wherever they are, they might have a radio station, they might have a television station, and they are communicating for their own need. But, of course, the signal travels through all the space. And there is a project in the U.S. called SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, that is looking and listening to all the noise that's coming our way from deep in the universe and trying to find out, is there a structured signal among all the noise that's coming? So the television signal, the radio signal, will have a certain structure to it. They're not random noise. But that's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So uh, you know, if you ask my personal uh, and scientific response, I would say that the probability that there is life outside is very, very high. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Dr. Nazari. Just looking at your presentation, and um, uh, it made me feel so proud to be an Iranian and to have someone like you, uh, you. Uh, talking here to us, and seeing also this young man, Bogak Ferdowsi, being part of the team. My question probably is out of this world in the sense that, you know, when <coughs> you when you study Chayyam, when you study all the our Iranian sages, they talk about astronomy, they talk about astrology, about truth, and how they, they, they approach it from a spiritual perspective. Now, for you to be in this profession, how has it affected you personally and your view of life? Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I, the, the question here is, uh, uh, you, you know, how do you reconcile science and spirituality? Uh, and I'll be um, uh, political and, and <laughs> answer it with an anecdote. Um, before I worked on, on the projects that you're, uh, you see here, I, um, in 2000, I was working in a different, I was a program manager for a program called Origins. And Origins was looking at finding other Earth-like planets and then talking about 
how life started here on Earth. So I was giving a lecture at JPL, public lecture. Uh, people came, and this was in 2000, remember, that's early days of internet, right? It was just taken out. And so, like most of you, I, I think in 2001 or so, I Googled myself to see what is it that people might be saying. And I came down and they say, you know, he does this project and the other project and all that. So I'm going down the list, and then I come to an entry that said, idiot of the month. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I sort of uh, scratched my head, you know, why is that entry under my name? And um, so, Curious, naturally, I, I uh, you know, opened the uh, uh, the entry, and as it turned out, it, somebody who was attending that particular lecture was a creationist, and took exception to me providing a different explanation of how life might have come about uh, on Earth. And uh, by the way, uh, you know, normally when I have my resume and people introduce me, I make sure that that award is also included among other awards because I'm particularly proud of it, to be called an idiot by that particular gentleman. Um, so uh, you know, if the, uh, your question aimed to know whether, how do I reconcile with the whole notion of uh, creation, uh, obviously I don't because uh, I don't believe in the literal sense of how life came about. I don't, uh, and I uh, beg your forgiveness if uh, uh, you are a believer, but uh, you know, religion is a discipline of faith. Science is the discipline of observation. Two different things, and I have respect for people who uh, believe on faith, uh, but uh, I don't believe in creation in a biblical sense, right? But, uh, and this may sound like a cop-out, and probably is, uh, I nonetheless consider myself spiritual. Not religious, but spiritual. Um, and and in a way that probably I have uh, come to terms with myself you know, to just have a peace of mind for myself. And I think different people who work in the technical areas, somehow uh, they come to terms with what is it that they believe and how do they reconcile that with the science that they know. Uh, I do believe in Big Bang. I do believe that everything that has happened, laws of physics, is sufficient to describe how the universe has evolved. You don't need creation. But then, of course, you get to the Big Bang, and then the question is, what was before the Big Bang, and all of that. And to me, that's not enough, because you cannot accumulate what you don't know now and call it God. Because that would have been different throughout the centuries, because the amount that we didn't know differed during the century. So because we do not know what came before Big Bang today, it is not because of that that I say I am spiritual. I just have a, have a need, maybe a personal need. Um, and that part is not scientific at all. So maybe, you know, I, I don't know whether the terminology is here also in, in the UK, in, in, in the US, uh, little kids always have a blue blanket. And the blue blanket is their security. They hang on to the blue blanket. If it's missing, God forbid, they can go to sleep. So that's my blue blanket for now. Yes? I had a question about the actual methods of getting uh, or escaping Earth uh, orbit. You mentioned the prohibitive costs as such and the remarkable precision you used to get to Mars. I was wondering, are we any closer to finding a cheap alternative in, to, to get in space other than chemical combustion, either ionic drives or antimatter or space elevators, and something that won't rely on waiting for a window of opportunity and will essentially open a door for interstellar travel? and travel across the surfaces. So uh, we are chipping away at, uh, the, the question here is are there better ways of getting off the Earth and are there um, better ways to do space travel uh, more cost effectively? And so we're chipping away at it. Uh, you, you know, first of all, there is a private sector now that is entering the fray 
um, you know, SpaceX uh, uh, is uh, providing alternative to government uh, um, uh, provided uh, launch vehicle. But nonetheless, that's still chemical. But there are, we're looking at two different things. One, getting it off the Earth and then sending it from, you know, propelling it from there to its final destination. There, we are thinking about, you know, possibly, uh, you know, building a moon base uh, that you could store propellant or maybe, uh, you know, harvest the water in the uh, poles of the moon to produce propellant is to get there and then refuel, is to put, uh, to put um, uh, fuel depots uh, in space. Uh, it, we're also investing on solar electric propulsion to be able to tug, uh, you know, massive payloads, which is much harder to do, uh, uh, you know, with the uh, chemical payload. But no magic formula yet. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, basically, my question is a bit more uh, technical issue. Um, we know that you know uh, larger density or larger masses have uh, generate uh, greater uh, gravity. I was just wondering to see that you know how do you manage to take uh, that robot away from Mars while you're having the Mars larger gravity, and what is the gravity? Yeah, thank you. So, so the, the question here is, once you have landed on Mars, how do you get it off again, right? So Mars has about one-third the gravity of Earth. So for those of you who want to lose weight quickly, <laughs> uh, a trip to Mars may be what the doctor orders. Um, but we haven't been able to take things off the surface of the Mars. We are planning for a mission which is called Mars Sample Return. In 2020, we're going to send a twin of Curiosity to Mars. It's going to cache samples of the Martian, uh, Martian soil in a football-sized container and leave it on the surface of Mars. We're going to send a second uh, robot to land on Mars, which will have a rocket to lift, and, and that's about the best that we can do, that soccer size payload, which would be about five kilograms, and lift it off the surface of Mars with a what we call the Mars Ascend Vehicle, which is basically a rocket on Mars, and put that soccer bar into orbit around Mars. And then we send a third spacecraft to go rendezvous with the soccer ball, fetch it, and bring it back. So for right now, one of the reasons that we're not ready to send humans is not only we don't know how to land them, is the question of how to uh, get them off. And the only way that you could do, do this thing economically is in fact to live off the land, to be able to produce breathable oxygen from, uh, from the atmosphere, and in fact to be able to produce fuel on the surface of Mars to, and you can imagine now how complicated it gets. When you launch a rocket here on Earth, a thousand people watching every aspect of it. There, you have to produce your fuel because the cost of taking the fuel from here to Mars and then landing it is just not affordable. So you have to learn how to live off the land and produce mm -hmm. your, uh, so for now, the answer to your question, we are not taking anything, let alone something with ways of time. These are all one-way trips. And by the way, a number of people have requested uh, tickets to Mars, and in <laughs> fact, there are some people I would love to issue them one-way tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so the queue starts uh, outside, yes. Yes. Maybe.
Uh, yes, the, the question is the uh, impact of the uh, moon and the planets on uh, our beings uh, and, uh, um, and do other planets have an impact on us. I uh, need to, um, aside from what I have said, that the they gravitational field sometimes dis uh, disturbs the asteroids and hurls them you know, uh, inward and the possible collision with Earth. Uh, with the rest of it, in terms of whether it has any direct effect on the human bodies, I have to uh, plead ignorance. I just don't know. Yeah, and, and the moon, and, and maybe some of my learned friends here can help me, it's either receding or it's uh, getting closer to Earth at a minuscule uh, rate uh, uh, annually. Uh, so uh, eventually, if you know the distance uh, grows substantially, and its impact on the sea level would uh, clearly will impact us. But uh, again, I cannot, uh, you know, uh, speak intelligently on the topic. that the objects are no longer gravitationally bound to sun. So, uh, but the law of gravitation says that any two objects exert force on each other. So would that mean that the solar system just goes on forever? Yeah, no, no. So, so again, uh, so even some of the, um, the uh, objects in the Oort cloud are so weakly bound to, uh, to the sun that any kind of, in, in fact, it's the source of uh, many of the comets that come to Earth because they're so weakly bound to the sun that uh, you know anything will throw them off. You can imagine that as you go further and further, nothing is in stable orbit anymore around the sun. So they're so weakly bound to the sun. So you're, of course, correct that no matter the distance, any two bodies exert you know, uh, gravity. Uh, gravitational forces on each other. But beyond certain distance, the, uh, it, it is no longer uh, bound to the, uh, to the central object in a stable form. That's what I mean. Because you never, of course, get rid of it. Yes? Thank you very much for all the information about the solar system and universe. Actually, um, I have one question, but I don't know if they try to ask or not. But, uh, uh, for example, if somebody talks about genes and cells, Yeah, so the, uh, you, you know, this uh, question has dogged NASA uh, for, you know, since the 70s. Did we actually go to the moon or was it staged in, in a um, Hollywood st uh, studio? And uh, you would naturally can expect what my answer is going to be. Uh, that, you know, there are... Um, uh, you know, no matter which one of the questions you answer, you know, if somebody comes up with another one. Why is the flag waving on, on, on the moon? There is no atmosphere on the moon. And there are pictures of the flag which is waving. And uh, the answer to some of them are ridiculously obvious because the things that they took to the moon, they had not only the pole, but also had a horizontal pole and they had the flag and it was pre-curved, uh, you, know, you know, when they launched it. So the, the answer to the question is yes. Uh, I definitely do believe that we went to the moon. Uh, and uh, there are uh, people divided in NASA. There are those people that say we should go back to the moon. Uh, the, uh, uh, the economic advisor, the NASA, the uh, science advisor to the uh, President Bush uh, thought, talked about we need to bring the moon under the economic influence of the Earth. 
uh, whatever that means. It's basically to go colonize the moon and be able to use the resources and, and uh, so he was thinking about it from the business sense. And there are those people that say, been there, done that. Okay, it's time to go to, the, uh, to Mars and go elsewhere. But uh, you know, your question is actually a topic of debate in, in NASA. There are the Moonies. You know, who want to go back to the moon, and those of us who say, you know, why do something that we've already done? Yes. Yeah, so um, two answers. Uh, two, uh, so the, uh, the, the question here is, um, you know, NASA gets a certain amount of money, uh, and wouldn't it be better if it was leveraged against, uh, you know, financial uh, antis from other nations, much like we do for some of the ground research uh, as the collider in, in CERN uh, is concerned. Uh, so uh, two, two questions. One uh, is I always feel compelled to say this, people think that NASA has this enormous budget. Uh, just to set that um, straight, if you take a single dollar of the federal budget, US federal budget, and then you take a penny of it, and you cut it in half, and you cut that in half, that's the budget of NASA. So it pales in comparison <coughs> with what, for example, the military uh, gets. And I suspect the answer to your question, don't know for sure, but I suspect, is because so much of the uh, space technologies uh, also has military applications. And uh, so, uh, you know, whereas there may be collaborations on uh, theoretical physics or uh, quantum mechanics, that people, countries, governments, are reluctant. I mean, we have a problem you know, with uh, 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 Chinese, Chinese foreign nationals walking into JPL. Students, postdoc, PhD students, and either they cannot come or they need to be escorted. Uh, there is a renewed sense of competition, as it once was with Russia, US and Russia. Now it's uh, uh, palpable between US and China. And I don't know for sure, but I suspect uh, part of it is the uh, military application of space technology. Yes. The, the, the question is, uh, what about the uh, you know unified theories uh, that the uh, physicists have been working on for a number of times? I know what I know, and I know what I don't know, and I'm a very poor theoretical physicist, so I wouldn't uh, you know wonder too much on, on that subject. But uh, you know, it's a hot area of research in uh, in physics. Uh, it's been a, a long pursuit of physicists to come up with a single theory that uh, ties all different forces, uh, four forces together. Uh, some of the best of them uh, happen to be, proud to say, Iranian physicists, for example, uh, Bafwa in, in Harvard, uh, working on string theory. Uh, but it, that's a field so far out of my domain that uh, uh, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on it intelligently. Yeah. Um, you were talking about uh, damaging nuclear environment here on Earth, and then a while ago, when the scientists were going to dig into North Pole or South Pole mines, there was so much concern around contaminating the environment. It's very concerned around contaminating Europe or Mars, which 
Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Uh, there is a, a very strict, uh, strict international standards of uh, two ways. One is forward contamination, one is backward contamination. In a forward contamination, any place where it has a potential for biology, uh, you, you know, uh, there are, um, uh, you need to sterilize, and you need, for example, if something is orbiting Europa, you have to make sure that at the end of the life, it crashes into Jupiter, and not into uh, Europa. And uh, that's what we normally do on, on the spacecraft that we send to, uh, uh, to Jupiter. We also have a backward contamination. If you're, in fact, going to a place where it has a potential for life, you'll always worry bringing a kind of a life form or virus back to Earth that humans don't have any uh, protection against. So similarly, and in fact, it drives the cost of missions to potentially habitable environment up quite a bit because of both uh, contamination forward and backward. But there are international standards and you have to obey them. So, can I just ask people if, hello? Uh, sorry, uh, do you mind if I could ask people, because I know you have so many questions and we have to bring the meeting to the end. If you have a question, please come over and ask a few of he'll be around. Uh, we are very grateful to him. Uh, we've been educated, we've been motivated. The biggest gift we could give to each other is motivation. Or we talk about spirituality, I like the word, Persian word, Ruhiyeh. The biggest gift you could give each other is Ruhiyeh. The biggest gift uh, Firuz has done to us, he's given us Ruhiyeh. He's made us pr proud, he's made us motivated, and He's made us extremely happy. So can I ask you to put your hands together and give oh. him a big thank you. Thank <laughs> you.